it's one of those things that uh, people love to complain about everything. And this is another thing they like to complain about, but okay. Uh, what I want to talk about is uh, a little bit of a ha'ara on uh, Parshas Balaischa. If you go back to the Mishkan, the Mishkan was dedicated on Rosh Chodesh Nisan. And starting from Rosh Chodesh Nisan for the next 12 days, uh, a Nasi of every day brought the identical korban. And it mentions over and over and over and over again the same korbanos, animals, incense, etc. And then at the end of the 12 Nisim, we have the mitzvah that Aaron is given the commandment to light the menorah every day in the Mishkan. So Rashi raises the point from Chazal why does it mention? the mitzvah of lighting the menorah here? Why is it juxtaposed to the korban of the Nisim? So Rashi brings Chazal, very, very famous Rashi, but it's from Chazal, that when Aaron saw that all of the Nisim were given an opportunity to bring a korban, and Aaron was not given the opportunity, because Aaron, in a sense, is the head of Shevet Levi. So Aaron thought, He's not worthy. It's because of the sin of the golden calf that he's being excluded. And Aaron had depression, Chalisha Sadas. So HaKadosh Baruch Hu says to Aaron, your portion is greater than their portion because you are given the mitzvah of lighting and preparing the lamps for being lit. So this is considered to be a nechama, a comfort to Aaron of Shelcha, Gadol Mishalohem, your chalik is greater than their chalik. Shata Madlik Umetiv Esaneras. Note there are two mitzvahs here. Madlik, you light. Metiv is you prepare the lamps. A kash, which I don't have an answer for, is that the chronological sequence is the other way around. First, uh, Hatava is cleaning the bowls and filling them with oil, and then you light. So it shouldn't have said madlik umetiv. It should have said metiv umadlik. I don't have, I actually don't have an answer to that. That's just a question to, to think about. So Ramban raises the question, what does it mean, shelcha gadol mishalahem? Why is it greater? I mean, Hashem could say, uh, this is what you have and they don't have, so that's your zechus. But what makes the menaira greater than what the Nesim did? The Nesim brought korbanos. Aaron is madlik umetiv esaneiris. Why is it shelcha gadol mishalohem? So one pshat might be very simple, and that is the korbanos of the Nesim were quite literally a one-time event. This is the only time they did it. Aaron's mitzvah will be nimshach for the rest of his life, which is 40 years. Right, so that's the symbol meaning why his thing is greater than their thing. Their thing is a one-time event. His thing is going to be nimshach for 40 years. But the Ramban gives a different pshat. The Ramban says, your mitzvah is greater than their mitzvah because their mitzvah only applies when there's a mishkan. But your mitzvah will apply even when there's no Beis HaMikdash. And the Ramban says, amazingly, that this is a remez to the holiday of Hanukkah. That there will be a time in Jewish history that your ritual of lighting the menorah is going to be remembered by all of Klal Yisrael. Even when there's no Beis HaMikdash, through the celebration of the holiday of Hanukkah. So the Rabban says quite amazingly that this Chazal is learning in the Psukim, Shalcha Gadol Mishalohem, your mitzvah is greater than theirs, that this is a remez to the mitzvah, to the Chi of Drabanan of Hanukkah. It's not a Doraisa, obviously, but it's a remez to the holiday of Hanukkah. That's how the Ramban understands Shalcha Gadol Mishalohem. As it may, we start off saying that Arain was depressed because he did not have the right to bring a korban as the Nasi of Shevet Levi. So there's another medrash that says something a little different. That Aaron was depressed, not Stamazai as Rashi brings it, because the Nisim brought korbanos, 
But it says Aaron was depressed because he saw that Shevet Ephraim was Makriv on Shabbos. Well, what's the pshat? Chazal tell us that Reish Chaydash Nisan that year happened to be Sunday. So the Chanukah Sanesim, the dedication of the Nisim, began on Sunday. That means the seventh Nasi, who happened to be the Nasi of Ephraim, brought his Korban on Shabbos. Because it's Deich Shabbos. So Mamela, what makes Aaron upset is not Stam. As Rashi, Rashi says Aaron was upset because all the Nisim brought Korbanos and Aaron didn't. That's how Rashi learns. But the Medrash says Aaron was upset because Shevet Ephraim brought its korban on Shabbos. So L'chaira, what's the pshat in that medrash? What, 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 is, what is particularly upsetting about Shevet Ephraim bringing a korban on Shabbos? Why would that be something that would make Aaron upset? So there's a really ingenious pshat from the Sefer Hadrash Ve'o'ian. This is the Reish Rav. He was a great uh, Godol uh, who lived, who died in the Holocaust. Ravarin Levin. Uh, he was not only a, a Godel, a Posek, a very big Talmud Chacham. He was actually a member of the Polish parliament. He was a, the, you know, Jew, the, there was a Jewish party in Poland before World War II to represent Jewish interests. Uh, and he was actually elected to the Polish parliament uh, and he tried to represent Jewish interests. This is before the Holocaust. A great Talmud Chacham. He is the grand, great grandfather, if you uh, know a very prominent Washington from attorney who does a lot for Klal Yisrael, a Nathan Lewin, perhaps if you follow legal matters, you've come across his name. He always uh, represents Chabad when they want to do a um, menorah lighting in public places and people bring lawsuits against it. So he's the one that defends them and the like. So Lewin was Levin in, in Europe and uh, Rav Aaron Levin was the Reish Rav, he was called. He wrote a sacred drash for Yoyin. And he says the following. What is Aaron's thinking why Aaron was excluded from Chanukah Sanesim? Because he thought he still had a pagam. He still had a defect because of the Chet Egel, because he participated in the Chet Egel. Now, here is the point. People ask the question, Aaron did make the Egel, right? They, they, come to, they come to Aaron and they say to Aaron, oh, Moshe's not here. So Aaron says, give me all of your gold. And Aaron throws it into the fire and an eagle comes out. And Aaron is considered to be responsible for making the eagle Hazov. What was Aaron's thinking? Why did Aaron make the eagle Hazov? So there's a vort b'shem the grah of what was Aaron's cheshbon in making the eagle Hazov. And the Cheshvan was L'shem Shemayim. And the Gra starts off his Pshat with a phrase the Gemara in Bava Basra uses to describe Eov. Remember the book of Job. Eov is a person who suffers a lot. And uh, Eov is very bitter and sorrowful. And the Gemara has a Lashon, Bikesh Eov, Lahapoch Esaka'ara Alpiha. Eov wanted to turn over the bowl. Again, what does that expression mean? Meaning he wanted to be kaifer biyikr. He wanted to say there's no justice, there's no God. He wanted to be haifei chesaka'ara. So the Gra explains what is exactly the meaning of that Lashon. And you'll see how we'll apply it to Aaron in a, in a moment. The Gra says, gives a mashal. Let's imagine you had a melech and the melech was very bad tempered. The melech would uh, overreact to anything that was the slightest slight. And you're a very faithful servant of the king. And one time you're bringing wine to the king and your hand tremors a little bit and a tiny little drop of wine falls on the king's garment. And even though you're the best friend of the king, the king says, off with your head, kill this man. So you love the king so much that's what you might do is you might take the whole bottle of wine and pour it over him. What's the logic? Because if you get killed because you spilled a little drop, 
people will think the king is crazy. But you love the king so much that if the king is going to kill you, you want to give the king a good excuse. So you pour the whole wine over him. And at that point, people will say, oh, for that a person deserves to die. He says, Eve was that way as well. Eve felt, again, there was a mistake, that what Hashem was doing to him was an undeserved punishment. He wasn't that bad. Maybe he had some little of Aaron. But he knew that people would look at Hashem, God forbid, is not just. So he turned over the Ka'ara, just like the Evet turns over the Ka'ara. So if Hashem is going to punish me, I want to give people a reason for Hashem to punish me. And that way, I will be mama'et. I will diminish the Chilol Hashem. You see how, how the Gra is understanding Eev, that Eev's blasphemy was a way to ensure that God's name would not be desecrated by an erroneous perception that God was not just. Meaning, I'm going to give God an excuse to punish me, and in that way, his name will not be desecrated. Says the Vilna Gaon, Aaron had a similar cheshbon. It is brought down that the Jewish people, even before the Chedo Ego, it's hard to understand, they already had a machshava to worship Avedah Zara. In fact, even by Kriyas Yamsuf, it mentions that one of the people whose name was Micha, not, not the prophet Micha, had an idol with him that he crossed the Yamsuf with a Pesah. Now, Avedah Zara is a very unusual Avera. Normally, Hashem does not punish you for an evil thought, but only for an evil deed. Right? This is the famous Gemara and Kedushin. Machshava taiva, a good thought that you're not able to carry out. HaKadosh Baruch Hu is mitzareif. Lemaisa. God counts a good thought as a good deed. Machshava ra, a negative thought, a sinful thought that you don't carry out. HaKadosh Baruch Hu does not count it as a Misa. Good thoughts are counted as deeds. Bad thoughts are not counted as deeds. In fact, it's fascinating, just to digress for a moment. The Lavush, who was one of the great uh, Paiskim in Poland at the time of the Ramah and the Shulchan Aruch, says this explains an interesting anomaly in Halacha. What is the Halacha if you're davening Shemona Esrei? And the Chazan is up to Kedusha. And you're in the middle of Shemon Esrei. Right? So everybody knows the halacha, I hope, that in the middle of Shemon Esrei, you're not allowed to answer Kedusha. But you keep quiet. And when the Chazan says the words, you're Machaven, that is Ke'ila, you said the words. So you've said the Kedusha by listening. So the Levush asks the Kasha, how does that work? Because if the reason I'm yotze by listening is shomea ka'ona, that listening is as if I said it, if that's the case, I'm mafsik in the middle of Shemona Esrei. Elamai, it's not like I said it. So how am I yotze kedusha? Meaning, why would being quiet and listening be a valid thing to do in the middle of Shemona Esrei? If it's ke'ilu you answered, it's a hefsik. And if it's Ki'ilu you didn't answer, you're not Yose Kedusha. In Lambdas, uh, you can ask, uh, you can debate that issue, but this is the Levush's Kasha. So the Levush's answer is this. When it comes to something good, we treat the thought as action. And when it comes to something sinful, we don't treat the thought as action. So, with respect to the mitzvah of answering Kedusha, which is a good thing, we treat it like action. With respect to interrupting Shemona Esrei, which is a bad thing, we don't treat it like action. Which means to say we take the same activity and Lagabe the Tzad of Tov, it's called a Misa. Lagabe the Tzad of Ra, it's not called a Misa. This is what the Levush says. Like a Palginan, we can take the same action or the same uh, response of being silent, define it as an action with respect to good things and not define it as an action with respect to bad things. So Mamela like this, it's true, going back to the Grah, 
that normally an evil thought is not considered to be a sin. But there's one big exception to that. The one big exception to that is idolatry. Avedah Zara, a machshava ra'a, is treated as a maisa. The Gemara and Kedushan uh, shows this. So here's Aaron's dilemma. Since Klal Yisrael, at least part of Klal Yisrael, already has a machshava ra'a of Avedah Zara, <coughs> God is going to punish them ben kachu ben kach. But if God punishes them without an action, It'll be a chilol Hashem. The Goyim will say, oh, their God uh, punished them for no reason. So Aaron says, this is what the grass says, it's a very strange pshat. Aaron says, since they already have a machshava li'avayda zara, but if they get punished for machshava, there's a chilol Hashem, I will make it a maisa of avayda zara. And that way God's punishment will be recognized and accepted. The same way Eov is mahapech, the ka'ara, so that people shouldn't think bad about the melech? I'm oh, sorry, shame that the servant of the king was mahapech, the ka'ara, so people shouldn't think bad about the melech? And shame that Eov blasphemed God, so people shouldn't think bad about Hashem? Aaron was machshil am Yisrael in a maisa of Abayda Zara, so that people shouldn't taina that Hashem punished for no reason, even though Hashem punished them for the machshav. Again, la halacha, this is an extremely problematical idea. I mean, it's like, you know, certainly we would never tell a person, oh, go and be machshil people and doing a maisa of Avodah Zorah because they have a bad machshav anyway. We, we normally don't say that. But this was Aaron's cheshben, that Aaron's kavana was l'shem shamayim, to be machshil klal Yisrael in Avodah Zorah b'maisa, so there shouldn't be a chilosim. By the way, just as a little aside, just want to digress for a moment on this. The idea that except for Avayda Zara, Hashem does not treat a bad thought as equivalent to a bad deed. So let me ask you a kasha on that. You, know, you may remember, well, actually it's coming up in a few weeks. At the end of the book of Bamidbar, uh, Parshas Matais, when we have a discussion of Nidarim, so the Torah says, if a woman makes a vow, uh, the husband has the ability on the day that he hears the vow to annul the vow, to be made for the vow. How far is Nadarim? Uh, so it mentions, if the husband is made for his wife's vow, and then she violates it, God will forgive her because the husband was made for the vow. So the Gemara asks the obvious kasha, what do you mean God will forgive her? If her husband is Mayfair the vow, there's no vow anymore. So it's not like she needs to be forgiven. There is no sin. If she made a vow not to eat apples and the husband is Mayfair the vow on the day that he hears it, she's allowed to eat an apple. She doesn't need forgiveness by God for eating the apple. So why does the Torah say if she breaks her vow after the husband is Mayfair, God will forgive her? So the Gemara in Nazar says, the case is this. She made a vow not to eat apples. The husband was Mayfair, but she didn't know the husband was Mayfair. So she thought she was breaking her vow. And it gives an example. You intend to eat a piece of pork. It happens to be you picked up a kosher piece of meat. But you thought you were eating pork? you still need forgiveness by Hashem. Because even though you didn't do an Avera, you thought to do an Avera. And therefore you need Kapara, and that's why the woman needs Kapara, because she thought she was violating her vow, even though the husband was Mayfair. So my question is, is that not a contradiction? If you're telling me that if I intend to eat Chazer, and instead I eat Kosher, but I intended to eat Chazer, I need Hashem's forgiveness because I had kavana to do a sin, even though I didn't do a sin. Now that's not a Zara, that's kashras. Isn't that a contradiction to the idea that a machshava ra'a, Hashem does not count for a maizra? So how do you reconcile that? So the answer would be that this is a little different. Because although you didn't do a maizra avera, you did 
carry out your thought in a physical action. Meaning to say, the din that a bad thought does not count as a bad deed is when all it is is in the realm of thought. But if I carry out my thought in a deed, even if the deed lemaisa is mutter, because it's kosher, that already is called doing a maisa avera, and for that you need a kapar. So, that, so don't confuse that with the, uh, the Gemara and Nazir on Hashem Yislach Lanya. Yeah. So why, why do you get punished? I mean, he's doing good things. No, the answer is, so, so again, the an, oh, okay, so we'll get to this, but the, the answer is that uh, his kavana was l'shem shemayim, but there's still a problem. Now, okay. So keep this chat about Aaron. You're going to see in a moment how all of this is going to come together in terms of the medrash, right? So Aaron's kavana was l'shem shemayim. So what happened was, Aaron had good thought, but bad deed. Good thought, but bad deed. Bad result, Avodah Zarah. Now, Yosef HaTzadik in Mitzrayim had an opposite idea. When Yosef is tempted with Potiphar's wife, who came to him day after day, and one cannot imagine how hard this was, day after day after day after day, tempting him. And there were moments where indeed he was on the verge of giving in, but he saw the face of his father Yaakov. And he did not succumb. But Yosef had thoughts of succumbing. So if you think about it, Yosef and Aaron are in the opposite way. Yosef was bad thought but good action. Aaron was good thought and bad action, meaning bad result. So which does Hashem consider more important? Your good thought or the good action at the end? So here's the point. Until the Medrash tells us, why was Shevet Ephraim, who is Shevet number seven in, this, in the list, given the special merit of being able to even bring his korban on Shabbos? That's a special merit, to even bring it on Shabbos. So the Medrash says, in the merit of his father, Yosef, who was Kovesh Es Yitzro, who conquered his Yetzir Hara, not to give in to Ashes Potiphar, Ephraim was given the merit of being Makriv on Shabbos. So now we understand why the Medrash says it was Shevet Ephraim Shehikriv B'Shabbos that made Aaron so upset. Until he saw Shevet Ephraim bringing a korban on Shabbos, Aaron could tell himself, you know, my sin is not so bad. I had good motives. And the ikar is the motivation, not necessarily the consequence. But when he saw Shevet Ephraim bringing it on Shabbos, which was the merit of Yosef that had bad thoughts, but good actions, that means the main thing Hashem looks at is the consequence, not the thought. Aaron says, Oy vey, now I'm really in trouble. In other words, you see that by seeing the validation of Shevet Ephraim, that's Makriv even on Shabbos, that kind of took away Aaron's comfort that because of his proper motivation, his sin was not so bad. That's how the Drash Vahian is Makasher, between Shevet Ephraim, Hikriv, Shabbos and Aaron's chalisha sadas, Aaron's depression. Okay. By the way, as a little aside, uh, the Vilna Gaon says, how did the Nisim know they could bring their korban on Shabbos? Let, let's go over the rules about korbanos on Shabbos. There are certainly many korbanos that are brought on Shabbos. The korban tamid is brought on Shabbos. The Korban Musaf is brought on Shabbos. 
the menorah is lit on Shabbos. The Ketoris is burnt on Shabbos. I think I mentioned the other day, it's lucky that the people with stones wouldn't have access to the Beis HaMikdash. I mean, they would start, uh, th they would start th uh, throwing stones, all this Chilol Shabbos that's in the Beis HaMikdash. Cooking and shechting and burning and lighting, what is going on here? Like the reform took over the temple or whatever, whatever it is. On the other hand, if I have to bring a burnt offering, I as an individual, or a sin offering, or chatas, I'm not allowed to bring it on Shabbos. So what's the chiluk? I'm just asking an informational question. What, which korbanos are brought on Shabbos, and which korbanos you're not allowed to bring on Shabbos? So the chiluk would be a korban sibor, a korban that's on behalf of Am Yisrael, can be brought even on Shabbos. A korban yachid, my own individual I cannot bring on Shabbos. Now, Lechaira, you can debate this. I would have thought that the korban of each nasi was the individual gift of the nasi. It was not brought by the tribe. So Lechaira, the korbanos of Nesim are 12 korbanos of a yachid. So who told Shevet Ephraim that they were given permission to bring it on Shabbos at all? Like, they would need a, a special divine permission to bring it on Shabbos. It wouldn't fall within the normal rules. Meaning, how did the Nisim know that their private korban could be brought on Shabbos? So here's what the Vilna Gaon says. The Vilna Gaon says, they inferred it from the choice of HaKadosh Baruch Hu's words. When Hashem commanded the Nesim to bring korbanos, He didn't tell them what to bring, but when He said, He said the following, Nasi echad layom, Nasi echad layom. Simple meaning, one Nasi brings every day. Right? But here's what the Vilna Gaon says. This is Mamish and genius. Nasi echad layom, nasi echad layom. Why is it repeated? Just say nasi echad layom. Why say the phrase twice? He says it means the following. There will be two days of the week in which only one nasi brings. The other days of the week will have two nasi. Now let's figure this out. The nasi bring for 12 days. Now there are two possible configurations. If it's not Docha Shabbos, so the first six bring Sunday to Friday, uh, yeah, Sunday through Friday. And the second group would also bring Sunday to Friday. In other words, if it's not Docha Shabbos. If that's the case, every day of the week had two Nisim because the first Sunday you had one Nasi, Nasi number six. And the second Sunday you had Nasi number seven. Meaning every day of the week, because it was six, it was six days, six days, every day of the Shavuah had two Nisim. Masha Enkin, if it's Deicha Shabbos, so the Korban is brought seven days in week one, Sunday to Shabbos, and five days in week two. So when would the last day be? Thursday. So that means Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, have a Nasi in the first week and a Nasi in the second week. Friday and Shabbos only have a Nasi in the first week. They don't have a Nasi in the second week. So the Torah says, Nasi echad layom, Nasi echad layom. Yom yom, there are gonna be two days in the week that will only have one Nasi rather than two Nasiim. But that works only if you bring a korban on Shabbos. Because if you don't bring a korban on Shabbos, then six, each of the days has two Nasiim, and Shabbos has no Nasiim. So the Vilna Gaon said, how did the Nasiim know that their private korban is going to be Docha Shabbos? Because Nasi Echad Layom, Nasi Echad Layom, it's a little bit of a complicated vort, that for two of the days of the uh, week, only one Nasi will bring, meaning Thursday, I'm sorry, Friday and Shabbos, will have a Nasi in week one and will not have a Nasi in week two. But this is the idea of Shevet Ephraim Hikrib B'Shabbos, 
that the Iker is the Maisa and not the Machshava, and that gave Aaron Chalishas Hadas, that made Aaron depressed, and that's why Hashem had to comfort him with the mitzvah of the, of the Menorah. Now, one, one halachic point that's worthy of pondering. The Rambam actually poskins. You know, we know that many avodos in the Beis HaMikdash can only be done by a Kohen, right? Only a Kohen can sprinkle the blood. Only a Kohen can burn the uh, limbs on the Mizbeach. But certain things don't have to be done by a Kohen. For example, the Shechita of a Korban, even though it's in the Beis HaMikdash, Shechita is kosher with a non-Kohen. A Yisrael can shech the Korban if he's tahor and he's able to enter the Azara. Okay. Now the Rambam Paskins that lighting the menorah does not, not only don't you need a Kohen Gadol to do it, you don't even need a Kohen to do it. The Rambam says lighting the menorah is kosher bizarre. An amazing thing. Hadlakas ha does not even require a Kohen. Now, the Rambam does say this immediately raises a certain question. Because where is the Menorah located? The Menorah is located in the Mishkan. And when we have a Beis HaMikdash, it's located in the Heichal. Now, the problem is, a Yisrael, who's Tahor, is allowed to enter the Azara or the courtyard of the Mishkan. And that's how we could check the Korban. But a Yisrael, even if he's Tahor, is not allowed to enter the Mishkan itself or the Heichal. So how could a Zor light the Menorah? A Zor is not, a Zor meaning a non kohen A non kohen is not even allowed to enter the room where the Menorah is kept. So what are you going to answer if they brought out the Menorah to the courtyard? He lights it and then they could bring it back in. That's not a teret. Because just like by Ner Hanukkah, you have to light it in the right place. You can't light it in the wrong place and then move it in. Right? By Ner Hanukkah, right? you can't light it on the table, then bring it to a window. You have to light it in the window or wherever you, know, wherever you hold, you're supposed to light. So the Rambam's answer is, you're right. What is the ukimta of a non kohen lighting the menorah? He has a huge stick, meaning he has a long stick, like 10 feet long. He lights it with a fire, and he stands outside of the heichal, and he projects his huge stick into the heichal, and he can light the menorah. In other words, he, he doesn't have to be in the heichal. The menorah has to be in the heichal. And that's why, that's, that's why a Zor could light it. So here's the simple question. I mean, Rashi is bringing a Chazal that Hashem is comforting Aaron that, okay, Aaron, you were not given the merit of bringing the Korbanos of the Nesim, but I'm giving you a greater mitzvah, Shatam Madlik Umeitiv Esaneros. What type of greater mitzvah? It's not even given to Aaron. This was not a mitzvah given to Aaron. Even a non kohen could light. So what, what comfort are you giving to Aaron by a mitzvah that's not even his to fulfill? Right? So, Hadlaka Samanaira is kosher bizor. So the Mephorshim say an interesting thing. They don't fully explain why. That although it's true that a menorah could be, could be uh, lit even by a non kohen But for the 40 years that Aaron was alive in the Midbar, he did the mitzvah every single day. So in other words, Itaka was his mitzvah. Lahaulacha, it's not limited to a kohen, even a kohen, a kalachomer, kohen gadol. You don't need the kohen gadol. But in the Midbar, in Aaron's lifetime, he was the only person who did that mitzvah. So, indeed, it was a special mitzvah that was given to Aaron. But the final point I want to make is an interesting anomaly in halacha, not so much with Aaron, but generally. We have two different mitzvahs here. We have a mitzvah of Hadlokas Menorah. And this is in the Mishkan, and this is in the Beis HaMikdash. 
And we have a mitzvah of hatavas haneros. Hatavas haneros is every single day the bowls and the oil and the wicks had to be prepared. Clean out the bowl, pour out the old oil, put in new oil, put in new wicks. And that was done earlier than the lighting of the menorah. Now, here's an interesting anomaly. Hadloka Samenaira can be done by anybody, even a non kohen even though in the Midbar, Aaron did it, but Ladoros, Hadloka Samenaira could be done by anybody. Hatovas Haneiros could only be done by a kohen. If a Zor were to prepare the lamps and pour the oil, the lighting would be puzzled because the Hatova was not done by a kohen. Now, this is very odd. Because I might have understood the opposite. I mean, I mean, how, how do you envision the relationship between Hatava and Hadlaka? I, I would look at it. Hatava is a preliminary thing to be able to light. I can't light unless I have oil and wicks. So I got to prepare the oil and the wicks. But it's what we would call a heksher mitzvah, a preparation for a mitzvah. How could it be that the actual mitzvah, which is to light the menaira, anybody can do? But to prepare the wicks and the lamp and the oil, only a Kohen can do them. It's like saying that, you know, I mean, Hatava Saneris is like buying matzah or building a sukkah. It's not the actual mitzvah. It's just a preparation. So the Bali Musr say a very, very beautiful word here. And that is, this teaches you that preparing for a mitzvah can sometimes even be greater than the mitzvah itself. Preparing is the thought, the effort, the commitment that you bring. Even though it's not the final mitzvah. The example would be, quite literally, turning on the lights. I mean, let's imagine you're making a, a party, you're making a kiddush, you're making a sheva brachas. So people work hard to set the tables and bring out the food. But the room is totally dark. And finally, the chassan and the kala come in and somebody turns on the lights and you see a beautiful, beautiful party. Now, are you going to be so thankful to the guy who turned on the lights? Oh, Baruch Hashem, you turned on the lights. It was dark. I didn't see any of this. And now I see it. No, the guy that turned on the lights is just the final stage. What really made everything possible was all of the hard work that was done behind the scenes. That's the relationship of Hatava and Hadlaka. Hadlaka is quite literally turning on the lights. That's a beautiful thing. But those lights can be activated only because somebody scrubbed the bowls and put in the wicks and put in the oil and put in the effort. And it's the effort behind the fulfillment of a mitzvah that might even be greater than the final mitzvah itself, where once that work is done, the mitzvah becomes relatively easy. Like the menorah, great mitzvah. But all the work was done. That's why, hadlakas on the menorah, the final action anybody could do. But it takes a very special person, a kaddish person, to put in the work and the effort. This is something to think about, you know, when we make siyumim. So we think about, uh, you know, if you're a married person, you think about, uh, your wife, you think about your, you think about your parents, you think about the support systems that you have in your life that enable you to accomplish those things that you're able to accomplish. That sometimes it's behind the scenes, sometimes nobody notices them, mm. etc. Uh, even here in Artsmeh, whether it's the people who work in the kitchen, the waiters, the the cook, you know, every, all the people that you know we don't always pay so much attention to. But they are like the people who are native as Hanerais. And then they allow the lighting of the candles, the lighting of the oratora to take place. And that explains the halachic anomaly that Hadlaka Samanera can be done by anybody. Hatava requires a very special person who puts in the work and the effort so that every single thing can be possible. Okay, we all have a good day. Mm -hmm.